Hello everyone, and welcome to today's session, Preventing Elder Financial Abuse, Help for Long-Term long Care Communities. Today's presenters are Kate Kramer, Older Americans Policy Analyst, and Denise Wells, Executive Director of the Nursing Home Ombudsman Agency of the Bluegrass. Kate, I will go ahead and turn this over to you. Thanks so much, Whitney. Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining the webinar. I'm Kate Kramer. And I am a policy analyst, as Whitney said, with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Office for Older Americans. And I'm very excited today to share some highlights from our newly updated guide to help long-term care communities prevent and respond to elder financial abuse. Before I begin, I've got a quick disclaimer. This presentation is being made by a CFPB representative on behalf of the Bureau. It doesn't constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the CFPB, and any opinions or views stated by me are my own and may not represent the Bureau's views. With that out of the way, let me tell you a bit about the CFPB. Our mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. Our Office for Older Americans is part of the Consumer Education and External Affairs Division within CFPB. Our work focuses on educating consumers and intermediaries and working to help protect older adults from financial harm and to help people make good financial decisions. Many of our resources are targeted towards adults age 62 and older, as well as financial caregivers and professionals who interact with older adults. Now let's talk very briefly about elder financial abuse before we introduce you to our updated guide for long-term care communities. First, what is elder financial abuse? You can see here the definition that we use. It's commonly understood by aging stakeholders, and I just wanted to get us all on the same page today. An elder financial exploitation or elder financial abuse is a fraudulent or improper action by an individual that uses the resources of an older person for that other individual's personal benefit or gain. The action taken by this other individual also would result in depriving that older person of the rightful use of their own assets or resources for their own benefit. And I want to note also that the age at which someone is considered an older adult and any related definitions are going to vary among states as well as within state civil and criminal laws. Financial abuse takes a lot of different forms. Someone who has a legal obligation to handle someone else's finances might fail to use those funds for necessities like food, clothing, shelter, or health care, and thereby put that person at risk of harm. And people who have a legal obligation to handle someone else's finances might include fiduciaries such as agents under a power of attorney, trustees, guardians or conservators, social security representative payees, or Department of Veterans Affairs fiduciaries. And if family or other individuals step in to manage someone's finances, some of those folks may try to take money or assets for themselves, and that can seriously impact someone's finances and it may result in an inability to pay nursing home or assisted living community bills if that is the home setting. In other cases, the perpetrator of elder financial abuse might have no legal right at all to manage an older person's money. Someone could try to take possession of or control another person's property by pressuring them, misleading or lying to them. They might try to gain their trust by promising to care for them as long as they provide access to a bank account or they may use other types of control tactics. I wanna share a couple of facts just to help show the scope and impact of elder financial abuse. And unfortunately, financial abuse is a common form of elder abuse. A 2017 review of various United States studies found that about 5.6% of older adults living in the broader community had experienced fraud or scams. And studies suggest that people living in long-term care communities may experience abuse at even higher rates than others living in the broader community. So about 7% of elder abuse allegations reported by nursing homes in 2015 involved financial abuse or misappropriation of resident property. And a 2019 review of studies from around the world estimated that 13.8% of older adults who lived in nursing homes, assisted living communities, or similar settings experienced financial abuse. 
And additionally, studies find that individuals who experience cognitive impairment are at greater risk of experiencing financial crimes. And many of us may experience mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease or dementia at some point in our lives. But it's very important not to assume or expect cognitive impairment when interacting with older adults. Many people who live into their 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond do not experience cognitive impairment and do continue to manage their own well being and financial affairs. Elder financial abuse may also affect some racial groups disproportionately. In a 2010 study, they found that 23% of older African American adults reported experiencing financial exploitation compared with 8.4% of other older adults. And a 2012 study found that 16.7% of older Latino adults self reported experiencing financial exploitation within the previous year. So, given all of this, what can we do to help prevent elder financial abuse in long term care communities? Well, the CFPB's Office for Older Americans created the guide that you can see here to help nursing homes and assisted living communities, their administrators and team members to prevent and address financial abuse of residents. The guide can help staff identify warning signs that might indicate financial exploitation and develop policies, procedures, and training to prevent elder financial abuse. Now, we released the original version of this guide back in 2014, and this month, we released a newly updated version of this guide, which reorganized the information and added new real life scenarios and new information about using technology, among other new topics. This guide is designed for nursing home and assisted living community administrators, as well as business office personnel or social service personnel, team members who might be involved in the move in process and other staff. Much of the information in this guide could be useful in other residential settings for older adults or people with disabilities as well. And other types of professionals can also read this guide to learn about preventing financial exploitation. So let's take a closer look now at the type of information that's in the guide. The guide uses brief scenarios about a fictional person named Alma to illustrate key concepts in the guide. These scenarios will provide different real life examples of financial abuse that you might see in your work. And this is an example here of one of these scenarios. The guide will walk you through four key steps to help protect older adults living in long term care communities from financial abuse. Prevent, recognize, record and report. And care providers are in a really unique position to help protect older adults from financial abuse. So this guide is designed to help you be ready to intervene and step in to help someone in need. So let's talk about step one, prevent. This focuses on preventing financial abuse from ever occurring or on taking steps to prevent an existing situation from continuing or growing worse over time. And since financial abuse is often ongoing, early identification of a problem can help prevent future financial losses. Some steps that could prevent further harm include early recognition, documentation, and reporting. So one important step for prevention is establishing and maintaining a team approach to financial security. Long-term care communities should assemble a team that will form the front line in financial abuse. These teams might include the facility administrator, business office representative, maybe a social work representative, an admissions coordinator, and other key team members. The team should be trained on the objectives for preventing and responding to financial abuse, as well as the jurisdictions and boundaries of local, state, and federal agencies and the interactions among these different agencies related to elder financial abuse. The team should implement a system for early effective responses to suspected financial abuse. They could do that through regular meetings, case review, and other coordinated action. And that system should also be part of any corporate compliance plan that the community might have. An effective team is going to promote the safety of the resident as well as the financial security of the nursing home or assisted living community itself. Moving in is a really critical time that can be confusing and emotional for new residents, families, and caregivers. It's really important to help new residents understand the policies at move in. So that, that could be done by giving the resident or someone who's acting on the resident's behalf a lot of information written in plain language. 
These are a few examples of important information to share things like the name of the team member who would answer billing questions and find out how to reach that individual. The process for responding to late or missed payments and any policies or systems for responding to reports of theft or financial abuse. Sometimes, as we said earlier, a resident might have a financial caregiver who has legal authority to help manage their finances, such as an agent under a power of attorney or guardian. That person might be the resident's family member or friend, or they might be a professional that the resident hired to help them. So if someone has a financial caregiver, it's really important to keep a copy of any documentation of the caregiver's authority on file. For example, requesting a copy of a power of attorney instrument or a social security rep payee authorization, trust documents, a guardianship court order. And if someone says that they're a financial caregiver, it's critical to ask for a copy of that documentation or check records to confirm that they do have that legal authority to manage the resident's money before you're disclosing the information to them. It's also critical to monitor payments to the nursing home or assisted living community because unpaid bills might be a red flag or a result of financial abuse. Of course, other possible causes could include um, inaction, maybe on an application for public benefits. There could be a glitch in a third party payment system. But monitoring those cases where payment for room and board or other services behind is important so that you can meet residents needs regardless of the cause. And it's also good to keep an eye out for folks who are lacking basic necessities. Maybe they don't have toiletries that they typically have, or they say they can't participate in outings because they can't afford the ticket or the fee. An early detection of these types of situations is really key to preventing outcomes like drained resources or involuntary move out over time. It's also important to think about hiring policies and ongoing training opportunities that are emphasizing abuse prevention. Criminal background checks are one way you can find out whether an applicant for a staff or volunteer position might pose a risk of financial abuse. And your state may have a perpetrator registry for elder abuse, which you could use to check the names of prospective new hires. I think it's also a great idea to involve the community as much as possible in staff trainings and educational events for residents. So you could invite a long-term care ombudsman, a police officer, an adult protective services representative, or a legal services provider or social service provider to come and assist with trainings and answer questions and explain what their role is in the community. Some financial institutions and financial professionals also offer free trainings for residents and caregivers. They may be able to explain how to prevent fraud or how to manage your money. And these sessions can begin an ongoing dialogue and can really help reduce people's vulnerability to financial abuse. And the guide has content like warning signs that you can use as you train your team members. And you can also use other resources from CFPB. We have a Money Smart for Older Adults Scam Prevention Program and a Managing Someone Else's Money Guide for Financial Caregivers. And we'll talk a little bit about those later today. Technology can also be used in many ways to help residents stay connected with their loved ones, even if they can't visit in person. So, for example, residents may have family or friends who are living far away or who maybe can't visit due to COVID-19 restrictions. And they could chat via text message or video call on a mobile device or computer. I've heard of people who couldn't travel to a wedding or another family gathering who are able to watch a live stream of the event. And so residents and their loved ones can really keep in touch and share photos, videos and information with one another, even using social media. And you can host meetings by phone or video call to help a resident's financial caregiver or other individuals to participate if in-person meetings aren't feasible. So if you have computers available for residents to use, your team members could help set up a video call or internet access for someone who's interested. Using these kinds of digital tools to visit with relatives can help to expose financial abuse because maintaining those strong connections with friends and family gives residents more people to talk to about any problems that they're having. And then if a friend or family member noticed something that seems suspicious, they could share concerns with a staff member or with the appropriate authorities. As technology advances, new online and mobile services may also be useful to help people manage their finances. For example, someone may be able to set up automatic alerts for their bank or credit union account 
so that they get a notification whenever a transaction occurs or if the account drops below a certain balance. Financial institutions typically offer services like automatic bill pay and direct deposit, and some mobile apps can even help remind a resident or a caregiver when to pay a bill or take other financial actions. And the bank or credit union can give you more detailed information about online or mobile options that are available. Let's move on to step two, recognizing elder financial abuse. It's really important to think about recognizing and recording any potential indicators of financial exploitation that you might observe, including if someone is interacting with friends, family members, and other visitors. The guide has a lot of information about different types of warning signs that might indicate financial abuse. And you can see on this slide, six categories of warning signs. Within the guide, each category lists several specific red flags that team members can watch out for. The guide also has detailed information about fraud and scams that target older people, including warning signs that scammers are targeting a resident. There are steps that you can take to help your team members and the greater community recognize financial abuse. So if you believe specific residents are the target of a phone, mail, or online type of scam, consider talking directly with that resident or their financial caregiver about your concern so they can review and discard those scam communications and begin to get practice at recognizing them. To avoid identity theft, it's great to add safety features like antivirus software, pop-up blockers, and password protection to any computers that you make available to residents for personal use. And you can also distribute email alerts, bulletins, or pamphlets, and other resources to warn people about scams, and especially those scams that you're noticing are more prevalent in your community or your area. And encouraging community members to watch out for those red flags and to report suspected abuse is really helpful. Again, we have free educational resources you can use, but free resources may also be available from your state attorney general's office, your local long-term care ombudsman, senior centers, other local organizations, and other federal agencies as well. It's important to keep clear and accurate records of any of the red flags or suspicious activities that you might be observing. So let's talk now about some best practices for recording signs of suspected financial abuse. Well, when suspicions arise, call a meeting of that financial abuse team that we talked about earlier. And for example, you might wanna meet if there's an account that's delinquent for over 60 days, or if you observe any of the red flags covered in the previous section. Talk to team members who might have observed relevant behavior and be sure that they're documenting each instance with the date, the time, what they observed, and contact information for any other witnesses who might have seen the situation. And document communications like phone calls, meetings, letters, emails. It'll be helpful for you to keep things organized and provide investigators with as many details as possible. It's also important to talk with the residents separately from any suspected perpetrator or perpetrators. The person might be acknowledged, hesitant to acknowledge a loved one's actions, maybe due to feeling guilt or fear of retaliation, or maybe they have sympathy for that perpetrator, and particularly in cases where someone has rescued their adult child or another person from trouble repeatedly. And also older adults from historically marginalized groups like people of color, recent immigrants, or LGBTQ individuals might not feel comfortable reporting abuse due to a history of discrimination by traditional institutions. But with support from a trusted advocate, sometimes someone who at first refuses to acknowledge financial abuse may later be open to talking about the experience if they're getting that emotional support and that open dialogue with their um, supportive people. It's good to write down your notes immediately after you have a conversation so that you can preserve an accurate record. And it's also great to get the regional or local long term care ombudsman involved and inform the resident about that program. Help the resident contact the ombudsman's office. If you have an ombudsman visitor who already comes to the nursing home or assisted living community periodically, the resident might prefer to talk to that person instead of making a call to the central office for help. And the final step is to report the suspected elder financial abuse to the appropriate authorities. 
Laws and reporting requirements are going to differ from state to state, so it's really important to learn what's required in your area. Your state's laws will include definitions of financial abuse or exploitation. They will also include any reporting requirements for suspected elder financial abuse, criminal sanctions, and other important guidance. The primary agencies that investigate reports of suspected elder financial abuse are Adult Protective Services, Law Enforcement, Licensing Agencies, and the Long-Term Care Ombudsman. Nearly all states require healthcare providers to report suspected abuse, neglect, and exploitation to Adult Protective Services, or APS, or another public authority. But APS doesn't actually carry out nursing home or assisted living community investigations in every state, so you should know which agency is responsible for investigating financial abuse of residents in your care setting. You can learn the following things about your state's laws, whether you or members of your team are mandatory reporters to Adult Protective Services or another public authority, whether you have any additional reporting obligations to law enforcement or licensing agencies, how soon that suspected financial abuse must be reported. For example, some places say immediately, some say within 24 hours, but also who is eligible for protective services. It's also important to think about the safe harbors or immunity provisions in your state's laws for reporting suspected abuse. Almost all states have provisions that provide immunity for good faith reporting of suspected elder abuse. This means that you wouldn't be held liable if it turns out that the activity that you observed and reported wasn't abuse, as long as you made that report in good faith or a similar standard that would be spelled out in your laws. And in most states, this immunity would extend to civil, criminal, or administrative actions. It's critical for all of us to report suspected elder financial abuse in accordance with the state and federal laws. Be as thorough as you can, but remember that you're just reporting a reasonable suspicion. You're not investigating a crime. You're not proving a case. So think of your role as sharing your observations in order to enable an investigator to then step in. And our guide contains a list of specific information that you might want to include in your report. And if you're not satisfied with a public agency's response to your report, you might be able to strengthen your report by providing additional information. You can ask that agency directly whether more information would help them to trigger or support their investigation. And you can ask to discuss the case with the supervisor. You can document the conversations that you have with these agency officials for future reference and make sure to note the dates and times of your conversations and who you spoke with. Be aware, however, that adult protective services or law enforcement agencies might be bound by confidentiality restrictions that prevent them from sharing some information with you. APS might not be able to share the details of a case without uh, the vulnerable adult or the subject of the case's express permission. And it might appear that APS didn't respond or they didn't provide services when in fact the agency did as much as it could. And this can be really frustrating. Reporters often aren't allowed to get information about ongoing investigations or you may not be told what's happening with the case, but it's still really critical to report suspected elder abuse in order to empower adult protective services and law enforcement to investigate and provide services as needed to help resolve the situation. Lastly, the guide also provides information about who to contact for help with specific situations like the ones listed here. And local civil legal services programs, often known as legal aid also, might be able to represent the resident or the resident may need to hire a private attorney if there are remedies in your state beyond adult protective services intervention and criminal sanctions. So some states have laws that help survivors of financial abuse or their attorneys to bring cases in civil court to recover assets. Some states also have processes to freeze remaining assets or to make it impossible for a property transfer to proceed if there's suspected abuse. And in some states, financial institutions, banks and credit unions, could delay a disbursement of funds, or they could put a hold on a transaction when they suspect elder financial abuse. Also, the resident might be able to work with a legal services attorney or a private attorney to file a case in civil court to request a restraining order or an order of protection 
that prevents the perpetrator from contacting the resident, and that can help separate the perpetrator from the resident to also prevent some further harm. I'm sure you can tell by now that there's a lot of information in the guide. It's a great resource to keep on your desk. You can hand it out at a family and resident council meeting, or you could share it with your local long-term care ombudsman or long-term care community administrator or staff. The guide is printed as a spiral bound notebook, so it's easy to keep it open to specific pages and enable you to easily refer back to it as you're reviewing policies and procedures related to, related to elder financial abuse. And you can download this for free online. You can also order it in bulk for free to get a paper copy if you prefer that. So before I hand it over to Denise, I just wanted to touch briefly on a couple more free resources from CFPB that might be helpful to you in your work. We have an excellent and also recently updated consumer advisory about planning ahead for diminished capacity and illness. This helps you to prepare for your financial future and take steps to protect yourself. It talks about other options uh, like powers of attorney and trust that you can put in place ahead of time to reduce future strain on yourself and your family if you do experience diminished capacity. It just helps people think through their options and take those steps to plan ahead. We also have our Money Smart for Older Adults curriculum, which is a scam awareness program we developed together with the FDIC. There are multiple components to this. There's an instructor guide and a PowerPoint, which you can use to deliver presentations to groups. There's also a resource guide, which is a handout that can be provided to groups or individuals. And the instructor guide is fully scripted, so you can present this content really easily in your community. You do not have to be an elder fraud expert because we give you the script, the PowerPoint, and all the tools that you need to get this out to residents, family members, and others who are interested in learning about scam prevention. And you can hand out that accompanying resource guide either as a supplement to the presentation, or you could just order copies to give out as a standalone resource. And you can order all of these free materials in English or Spanish for free in bulk if you go to our website. Our Managing Someone Else's Money Guides introduce critical concepts to financial caregivers, like agents under a power of attorney, guardians and conservators, trustees, and Social Security and Veterans Affairs representatives. These guides can help answer questions about what your rights, responsibilities, and options are as a financial caregiver. And we also have information to help you co-brand the guides with your organization's name if you like. You're welcome to co-brand them and share them in your community. These are great to order in bulk and hand out to people who have questions about caregiving and again available for free in English or Spanish. We also have a fraud prevention series that helps you share information about common scams. Last fall, we released new materials, including bookmarks, posters, and table tents, all of which you can order for free. And a lot of these resources have word games or crossword puzzles or other activities to help people learn about key concepts in fraud prevention. And these are great to hand out for events or group meals or even to display in your office or give the free bookmarks out at events. You can also download electronic versions of these and share them in email newsletters or on your website. We have Ask CFPB, which is an online resource that has answers to a lot of questions about financial products and services. And all of these answers can help people make more informed financial choices and better manage their money. The final resource I wanna share with you is our Coronavirus Hub, which has resources to help people protect and manage their finances during the pandemic. CFPB also has a special COVID-19 housing hub that's designed to provide people with mortgage and housing assistance. And there is a new rental assistance finder tool specifically for renters who need help. So you can find all of these on our coronavirus page. You can also join our Office for Older Americans mailing list to get occasional alerts about blog posts, new resources, and other updates. I wanna thank you so much for your time today. And if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the session. Now I'm going to turn it over to Denise to share some of her experiences with you. Hi, thank you, Kate, um, for sharing all that information. Um, I know that that's probably really helpful for so many of you on the call. Um, so I hope that you will go to their website and download a copy uh, to look through and order some in bulk. Um, 
As uh, was mentioned, my name is Denise Wells, and I am the executive director at the Nursing Home Ombudsman Agency of the Bluegrass. We house Kentucky's uh, long term care state long term care ombudsman program, as well as one of the local programs in central Kentucky. Um, I'm going to share. I want to share with you today uh, how Kentucky took this guide and made it work for us and our state long term care ombudsman program. Um, as well as an overview of, of what an ombudsman is. Um, a quick primer, an ombudsman is an advocate for a resident living in long-term care. And every state in the United States has this program. Every state has a state long-term care ombudsman who runs the program to advocate for residents in long-term care. Um, ombudsman is a Swedish word for advocate and we are tasked with protecting and promoting the rights of long-term care residents. In Kentucky, that includes nursing homes, personal care homes, and family care homes. Other states also include assisted living facilities and even home, uh, home care programs. So at the end of this um, presentation, I have a place for you to find your local long-term care ombudsman program. Um, so we, we help residents exercise their rights. Um, when somebody moves into long term care, they have an additional set of rights, but most people don't know that. So we're tasked with educating about them about those rights and helping them exercise them. Um, one of the focuses we have is that residents have the right to complain when they live in long term care. They specifically have a right to bring up problems with their care or their stay while they're in the facility and ombudsmen are especially authorized to investigate and resolve problems or complaints that residents have with their consent and guidance. So um, when residents have a problem, they can call their local ombudsman, like Kate said, um, facilities can call us when there's an issue that, that we need to investigate and families can call us, but we always start with the resident, visit with them, make sure that they give us consent to work on that complaint. And then finally, we work to monitor local, state, and federal laws that affect long-term care residents. And so when we first um, heard about this guide at the National Consumer Voice Conference, we thought that it would be perfect for our uses. Um, we do find that, as Kate said, financial exploitation is a, is a common form of abuse that residents experience when they're in long-term care. Um, so, and a lot of misinformation is spread about financial abuse and how to report and when you can report. So this is a great guide to really clarify um, those points to make sure that residents get the help that they need as soon as possible. Um, so I do want to share with you just a, a case study from before we had this guide, before we um, took it and added Kentucky state laws and Kentucky um, information. We had a resident named Dottie move into the nursing home in her small town. Uh, she was alert and oriented. She knew what was going on. She was um, very involved in the nursing home. She was friends with everybody. Uh, she elected to have her 20 year old granddaughter act as her power of attorney. Um, and unfortunately, while she was living in the long term care facility, uh, her granddaughter stopped writing checks to the nursing home. She was private pay at that time. She had significant savings and she received a pension and social security, um, but nobody was getting uh, paid for her care. And so the facility, unfortunately, as is somewhat common in, in nursing homes, was experiencing some great amount of turnover. The business office position had three new people in less than a year which meant that Dottie's bill just grew and grew and grew with no staff intervention. Nobody even told Dottie that her bill had been unpaid so that she could talk to her granddaughter and see what was happening. Finally, the bill reached over $100,000. She had a six figure bill and the administrator issued a discharge notice for non-payment and still didn't tell Dottie what had been going on. Well, um, if you're in a nursing home, you're required to send a discharge notice to your state ombudsman program. So that's how we heard about this situation. And so the ombudsman went and talked to the administrator and we tried to remind them of the facility's responsibility to protect residents from abuse, including exploitation. Um, and as Kate mentioned, they're mandatory reporters. Not only are they tasked with 
protecting residents from abuse, they're also required to report any suspected abuse and the facility had had uh, great suspicions that Dottie's granddaughter was using her funds for other um, things, not Dottie's care. So as the discharge date looms, gets closer and closer, the staff finally filed a report with Adult Protective Services, but the fallout of this is swift and severe. Dottie's devastated to find out that her granddaughter had taken advantage of her, but like most residents, she didn't want her to get in trouble. Her granddaughter was arrested for financial exploitation and in all of the chaos, Dottie's family really um, was upset with her and she kind of became almost a pariah. Her family didn't visit, the community all knew about it and Dottie's emotional health just plummeted. She was, she was so upset and now all of a sudden her support system had been cut off. Um, fortunately, the ombudsman was able to appeal that discharge notice and she was allowed to stay in her home, but that financial and emotional damage was done. Um, her granddaughter was unlikely to be able to pay that restitution um, and it kind of broke up the family. Uh, I can share that because this case was a few years ago before we had this guide, I am relieved to say that the family finally reconciled, but there are so many places in this story where this guide could have helped a facility intervene and, and save Dottie from this kind of trauma. Um, so it's really important, you know, this is an extreme example, uh, example, a six figure bill is, is very extreme, but, um, it does happen and, and we have ways to prevent it. So this, this guide can really be helpful in that case. Um, so I think I've, uh, yeah, so like I mentioned before, financial exploitation is common. Um, Kate mentioned that. And although most perpetrators are family or friends, facility staff can also exploit residents. Um, this guide really focuses on facilities protecting residents from outside exploitation, but facilities should also have a thorough policy to prevent abuse by staff. Um, misinformation is rampant when it comes to financial exploitation and really just in when it comes to paying for long-term care in general. Um, so before we published this guide, it was kind of, almost informal, a facility would tell us, well, we can't, we can't report financial exploitation to APS until there's a discharge notice, but we don't wanna file a discharge notice. Well, that's not true. You can file a report to Adult Protective Services as soon as you have a suspicion that somebody is using a resident's funds inappropriately. Um, but when we told them that it was, it was almost always verbal or through email and it didn't always seem to stick. Um, so, Fighting word of mouth and misinformation with word of mouth information is not effective. This guide has been an authoritative resource or author authoritative voice for ombudsmen, families, facilities to fight misinformation and better protect resi residents from financial exploitation. Um, so how we made the guide work for us and how you can make that work for you, um, and I know, I imagine some of the people on this call are representing facilities or other senior service providers. Um, and I would really encourage you to download that guide and see where you can plug in your state specific laws, regulations, resources. Um, even if you just download it and have that guide in your own building or in your own office, um, we were really fortunate. We were able to write a grant with um, the Kentucky uh, Board um, of Attorneys to take the guide and and put it into Kentucky. You know, put in Kentucky's laws and systems. Um, and then I think that it's really important if you're going to write this in a way that you share it with others that you send it to the people involved um, to review and revise. We, want, we wanted to make sure that the information we were sharing was accurate, even though it's not legal advice and we have that disclaimer, just like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau does. Um, but we did want them to look at it and make sure that, you know, Adult Protective Services looked at it and said, yes, you know, this is how this works. Um, we did that with our regulatory body, which is OIG and a facility administrator that we work with and then we did a print and publication and we um, shared with our, what our uh, regulation agency 
and they sent it out in their newsletter and we were able to get a lot of facilities interested in learning more and we were able to send the guide out to them um, for them to share with their staff. Um, and that was kind of the big piece of, of us taking this book and creating a Kentucky specific guide was um, the opportunity to go into the facility and provide a training to, to the staff there. Um, so, you know, if you have that opportunity, I would really encourage you to try to show the administrator or staff training um, supervisor the guide, talk to them about how that would benefit um, their staff and their residents and offer that administrative staff some training, especially, you know, ask them who would be on your abuse team. Do you have an abuse team? Um, how do you approach financial exploitation cases? And then if you, you know, if they need help getting them started, that that can be something that uh, some service providers are able to do. Um, and then as an ombudsman, we see a lot of stories. We see a lot of strange cases and unique situations. Um, and I always tell the ombudsman in Kentucky to try to use specific cases that you know of to, um, to really make it relevant to the facility staff. Um, one of the stories that I almost always tell is about a resident, um, you know, when President Obama was in office, he developed a program that allowed people who were on Medicaid to receive a cell phone and um, limited monthly minutes. And residents who were on Medicaid were eligible for that benefit. So a lot of residents filed, you know, the facilities helped them file, they got cell phones, they got their minutes, and they were better able to communicate with family and friends. Um, and this gentleman had a cell phone, one of those cell phones, and a staff person had a family emergency and, and he overheard about it and offered to let the staff person use his phone to call um, their child's school. And uh, she did and she gave it back and she was so grateful and he was happy to be able to help. Um, a lot of residents feel like they, they don't have opportunities to help others while they're living in long-term care. So it was a really great experience. But then when that, staff person had another situation a few weeks later come up rather than go to that resident truly rather than go to the facility staff phone line um, she went into that resident's room found his cell phone used it to call whoever it was and used the rest of his minutes and that's such a unique story but it is an example of somebody using his finite resources for their own benefit and thereby taking them from him. He no longer had minutes for the rest of that month to communicate with his family and his friends um, or to call the ombudsman to tell them what had happened. So it's not always somebody not paying a bill or somebody um, taking cash out of a resident's pocket. It, it's, it's any kind of resource that that resident needs. Um, so keeping that in mind, sharing relevant stories with your audience um, is really important. So once we had this, we publicized it. We had a few facility trainings. Um, we had another case come up. This facility had um, received the guide, but we hadn't done a, a full um, training. They didn't have a, a team necessarily to address abuse or exploitation. Um, but this gentleman, Perry, was 20. He has severe mental illness. His mother was his guardian for the longest time, or has, is his guardian, was his guardian, and took care of him at home um, until he turned 20 and she wasn't really able to provide adequate supervision anymore. Um, so she moved him into a rural personal care home in Kentucky. Uh, his social security disability was supposed to go to the personal care home um, to provide for his care, but they hadn't uh, received the first two months of payment. So the facility had been um, trying to call the mother to ask for the payment and she didn't understand exactly what was going on. Um, she we, they called the ombudsman, the ombudsman called and uh, spoke with the resident's mother and she felt like she really hadn't been informed of that financial obligation before she moved in. She moved her son into the personal care home. Um, and in fact, her household relied on his income for rent and groceries and utilities, which is so common in a lot of households with somebody receiving direct care. Um, the loss of that, that check can really um, be an, have an impact on the household. Um, and so, you know, she 
the facility did call adult protective services to report financial exploitation and an APS investigator and state trooper opened a case and um, communicated with the mother. And after that investigation, she did begin sending his income to the personal care home. Um, but that didn't, but that didn't really solve her issue of not having the money to pay for her care, you know, her own needs and her family's needs in their home. Um, but fortunately, because the facility had called APS, APS was able to help connect her with other social services that would help provide her with um, resources so that her children at home could continue to receive the groceries, the school supplies, the things that they needed. Um, and so this guide really, really helped that family in all kinds of ways, getting adult protective services helped that family not only, you know, keep the resident Perry in a home that was able to take care of him, but it also helped his family um, maintain their household. Because we have seen in some cases, a family will bring that person back home because they just can't make it work without that resident's disability or social security check. And that's a real concern that that, that person then may not be getting the care that they need. Um, some other ways that you can help protect residents from financial exploitation, multidisciplinary teams are a great, great, great group to start in your area if you don't already have one. Um, these task force forces connect local law enforcement, state and county attorneys, adult protective services, state guardianship if you have it, the ombudsman program, and other victim advocates to discuss cases and trends in elder abuse. So in Lexington, Kentucky, Fayette County has an excellent uh, multidisciplinary team, and you can find out information about these teams. You can search for that in Google, and the Justice Department has a whole page. The link is also on this slide. As Kate said, the state's attorney general, your state's attorney general can be a great resource as well. Um, Kentucky's Governor Andy, Andy Bashir was formerly our attorney general, and he uh, senior um, protecting seniors from financial exploitation was one of his um, focuses during his um, time in that office. And so he had annual conferences and we shared our book with attendees there and vendors. Um, and it was a great opportunity for facility staff, for community members, for families to learn more about how they can protect um, a loved one or their residents from exploitation. Um, and then you may, you should have an elder abuse coalition in your area. Um, every state has area agency on aging um, offices that should be holding these meetings. Um, and they may be an opportunity for you to get involved to learn more about resources. And in Kentucky, again, a lot of our, um, our committees have conferences, the Fayette County um, or the Bluegrass Committee has an emergency fund for victims who needed immediate housing option and hands-on care. So they worked with hotels in the area to, um, to have a place for somebody to go and then home health agencies so that there was somebody to go take care of that person while they were in the hotel to protect them from um, their perpetrator. Um, and then as Kate said, there are so many great resources um, on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's website. We have shared the, um, the guides to, to managing someone else's money with residents and families who feel overwhelmed with um, what guardianship is, what it means, and how they can make sure that they're following the law and following their loved one's um, wishes. Uh, and then I think it's great if you have the opportunity to con connect with your local ombudsman. You can go to the state. Uh, the Consumer Voice is the national advocacy group that um, works on behalf of long-term care residents, and they have uh, a map where you can click your state and see even who covers the county you live in, um, and you can get their contact information there. You can contact our office, and I can talk to you about um, you know, either connecting you to your ombudsman or uh, more information about how we used this guide. That's our office phone number. Um, Noah at Ombuddy is just a general email box that um, we use. And then if you wanted to contact me directly, that's my uh, email address. And um, I'll turn it back over to Whitney for questions. Um, but thank you all so much for, for being with us today. Thank you, Kate and Denise. We have now reached the Q&A portion of the webinar. 
if you've not done so during the presentation, please enter any questions or comments in the chat box or the Q&A box. During our Q&A portion, a few more poll questions will appear. We do ask that you answer these while our panelists are answering your questions. And lastly, we've received a couple of questions about will the PowerPoint be available? Will the web, the recording be available? Um, we will not be making the PowerPoint available. However, the recorded version of this webinar will be available on our website in about a week. Now I'm going to head over to our first question. This is for you, Kate. Um, some of the nursing homes are abusive to patients and the administration does nothing. How can we attack this problem? Thanks for the question, Whitney. And that definitely is a challenging question when there are care team members or volunteers of an assisted living community or nursing home who are financially abusing or who seem to be financially abusing a resident. Um, one of the first things would be to report your concerns to the administrator or the team member who's responsible for receiving those reports. But it sounds like in your question that hasn't been very effective. So if the problem isn't resolved, you should be able to file a grievance or a complaint or both. And then depending on where the person lives, you can report to different agencies that oversee them. So if it's a nursing home, you could report to the state survey agency that oversees Medicare certified or Medicaid certified nursing homes. You could also report to the state licensing board for the perpetrator. So for example, say the perpetrator was a licensed nurse or another type of licensed professional, you could report to the board that licenses that person to file a complaint. If they live in an assisted living community, you could report to the assisted living licensing board or again to the state licensing board for the specific perpetrator if they are a licensed professional. Um, hopefully that's helpful. If, if I can chime in, um, we, we always tell staff because I, I feel like sometimes this is a staff person who reports abuse to their supervisor and it doesn't get taken seriously. Um, I always tell staff that they can also call, like Kate said, adult protective services and report abuse. Um, as well as, like uh, Kate said, the regulatory agency, they can call the ombudsman program, um, but. You, you should definitely call and report them. Kentucky has the nurses um, abuse registry that 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 person can be put on to to make sure that they don't perpetrate any more abuse, um, but definitely, definitely call other resources and other agencies to make sure that that abuse is stopped. Well, that's really great advice. So we have another question that's come in. Uh, and Kate, this is also for you. And Denise, again, feel free to chime in if you have any additions. Um, what if the residents reports to APS? APS does not feel they need to act. Are there any other options or follow up suggestions? Yeah, so I touch on this a little bit, but it can be really frustrating when this happens. And one thing you can do is follow up with Adult Protective Services and ask them if there's certain information that you could provide to help with their investigation to help them take the next step. Again, asking to talk about that case with the supervisor and really keeping very detailed notes about who you're talking to, when you talk to them, what was the content of the conversation so that you have for your own records sort of a paper trail of what the steps are that you've taken. and. NAPSA, the National Adult Protective Services Association, has some resources on this. Like they have a fact sheet with information about different steps that could happen after you report suspected abuse. And that can be helpful just to understand what might be going on behind the scenes and why some things take longer than sometimes it feels like they should when you're the reporter. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Denise, do you have anything to add? Um, I think that, uh, as, as you said in your presentation and. Following up with adult protective services can be really important. Um, we, we report to adult protective services when a resident gives us permission and we, um, almost always follow up because you can, we will call the central intake line, give them the report. And then we call back about 24 hours later and ask them if they accepted it for investigation. And if they didn't, we find that. 
we can ask, you know, why, why it wasn't accepted. Um, and then if it's a, a situation where they, you know, sometimes our adult protective services staff will say, well, we didn't. We didn't see anywhere where you outlined what the harm was of the situation that happened. So then we, we rewrite the report or we re report it with that information. Um, and then sometimes if it isn't something that is under the purview of adult protective services, um, there, there are some other resources for you, like the ombudsman program, because we go by what residents want and what a resident gives us consent to do, we're not having to follow um, the same regulations and strict guidelines as adult protective services or the regulatory agency in your state. So we can, we can investigate something and advocate for change if adult protective services or the regulatory agency is not able to. Great, I think we have time for um, one more question. Someone asked, do you also see cases of elder abuse in independent retirement living communities, not nursing homes or assisted living? Yeah, absolutely. Elder financial abuse happens no matter where you live or who you are. I think it's something that really impacts people from all walks of life and in all situations. And there you know, are family members and friends who may be taking advantage of someone, there are also scams that are perpetrated by strangers that can target anyone by phone or email. So that's definitely, um, unfortunately, a very prevalent issue, no matter where the person is living and no matter what age the person is either. Financial abuse can affect anyone. I agree with Kate, and I honestly think that this guide would still be useful in an independent living setting um, for staff there just, at, you know, to have that information so that they can help recognize signs of abuse because th those staff would most likely in most states, as Kate said, they would be included in a mandatory reporting law, which would mean that if they had that suspicion, if they saw red flags of abuse, they would be obligated to report it and this guide could help them do that effectively. Great, thank you. So we did receive a couple of questions that are very specific to situations that people are going through. Um, so instead of addressing them here, I'm putting in two email addresses. One is Denise's and one is the Older American email address here in the chat. I put it in there for all attendees. So um, if you have specific questions, feel free to email those to you know, either Kate or Denise and um, they can guide you in the correct direction to find the answer that you need. Um, we are coming up at the end of our webinar. So thank you all very much for attending. And please be on the lookout for an invite email next week from the Office for Older Americans for our upcoming webinar on November 10th, Managing Someone Else's Money, Tips and Tools for Financial Caregivers. Thank you so much, and this concludes today's webinar.